Good people, this is the ROG Zephyrus S17. Now, if you've been following our channel for a while, we've been covering a lot of 15-inch gaming laptops. 14 inches are also starting to become like a thing now, but uh, we thought it would be interesting to check out something that's fully loaded, supersized, and a little bit different. So here we are with the S17. This is also the first laptop that we're gonna review featuring Intel's newest 11 gen H45 Tiger Lake CPUs. Uh, we've done some comparisons to set us up on the right path, and it looks like Intel might have a seriously competitive product. However, from a usability standpoint, Asus has made a lot of questionable choices that made me go from, hey, I might actually use this or switch to this as my editing slash gaming laptop at home to maybe I should just stay away from this. So sit back, grab a cup of coffee or fruit or vegetable, whatever that's all with you, uh, and tag along with me as I go through this monstrosity from top to bottom. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. Extra 5 MZ1 Zyzrail, a unique project and a very unique mouse designed by Rocket Jump Ninja for better aim. After testing more than 250 mice, Zy knew what a mouse needed for maximum aim potential, but the shape did not exist. So he teamed up with Extra 5, shaped his own mouse, and loaded it with top tier components. That means Pixar 3389 sensor, KLGM 8.0 switches, and the new EasyCord Pro on the lightest Extra 5 mouse yet. A killer in the right hands? Try it out for yourself on extrafi.com. Okay, so let's get pricing and specs out of the way. This laptop starts at $2,200. And for that, you get a Core i7-11800H with eight cores and 16 threads, 16 gigabytes of RAM, a terabyte of storage, an RTX 3060, and a Quad HD 165 hertz display. For $500 more, that bumps up the CPU to the i9-11900H, which has a higher base and boost frequency, and a 3070. And $600 more, and well, you'll get twice the memory and storage along with a 3080 with 16 gigabytes of VRAM. Keep in mind that this is the sample that we're testing. And finally, there's a top tier spec with three terabytes of storage configured in RAID and a 4K 120 Hertz display. The price, 3,700 US dollars, which is like $5,000 Canadian, which could end up being more, especially because taxes here are crazy. So before you guys even hit the keyboard, I'm just gonna say it. It's expensive, like really expensive. And it's something that most people might not find appealing, which I totally vibe with. But there is a niche market for these 17 inch elite performance laptops that deliver desktop level performance while also being somewhat portable. And if you fall into that criteria, well, you might wanna stick till the end because some of the performance numbers that thing, this thing spits out is just crazy. As for availability, some of the models were expected to ship by the end of June, but at the time of making this video, I couldn't find any in stock, both in the States and here in Canada, so uh, this is a little bit difficult to get hands on right now. Um, as for competition, well, there is the Legion 7 with a 16-inch display, a Ryzen 9 5900HX CPU, two terabytes of storage, and a 3080 for $3,250. But unfortunately, there are some shipping delays uh, due to the pandemic. And then there's the Strix G17 with a 1080p screen, lower build quality, pretty high in specs for around 3000. And the availability is unknown for that. So while these higher end systems are pricey as well as hard to find, I can certainly tell that Intel's 11 gen laptops are priced right in line with AMD's. With that out of the way, let's get into the design of the new S17. And I appreciate the stealth approach Asus went with both on the front lid and the interior space. You're essentially getting a matte black chassis with a stylish dot pattern embedded that adds a subtle touch of gaming DNA. Um, it's really well done and it also does a pretty good job resisting fingerprints. The build quality is fantastic. I mean, the whole thing is made out of a combination of magnesium alloy and aluminum and uh, it's put together really well. Um, I mean, I would be expecting that considering the price point. However, the hinge does exhibit a little bit of wobbling and I'm thinking this is because of the two small hinges at the corner that's having trouble you know, holding up this massive 17 inch display. As for size, it's pretty big, but it's not as bad as the beefy size laptops that we're used to seeing like four or five years ago. It's still relatively portable, but I would still make room inside a backpack to just accommodate this thing because it weighs six pounds or almost six pounds uh, or 2.6 kilos and it's 0.78 inches thick, which coming to think about is thinner than the Legion 5 Pro. So the trade-off is definitely the form factor, but that makes sense because you're getting a 17-inch screen and uh, a fully loaded RTX 3080, which is just 
crazy. Oh, also, quick note on the power adapter. The cable is easier to manipulate, and the adapter itself is fairly big. So you'll also make, need to make sure that you have room in your bag uh, to put that thing as well. The keyboard layout on the new S17 is a little bit different this time. You see, if you're aware of the Zephyrus Duo SC that I reviewed recently, you would know that it comes with a second screen that elevates at an angle when you open the main lid. It's the same mechanism on the S17, but this time, instead of the second screen, you actually get a full-size keyboard, and that makes it easier to use than having the keyboard at the bottom with the trackpad on the uh, on the right-hand side, which is just super uncomfortable. Uh, this elevation has a few tricks up its sleeve. The first thing is that it gives the user a comfortable typing experience, and two, uh, there are a few intake vents uh, for cool air to get inside the components and then an exhaust out the back and through the sides. It's pretty brilliant if you ask me. However, I do have to talk about this keyboard, specifically these optical mechanical switches that ASUS has implemented here. Now listen, We've seen laptop manufacturers in the past experimenting with these type of mechanical switches on gaming laptops, and the feedback has been kind of mixed. I mean, some love that sort of tactile bump that you get when you press these buttons or these keys, and then others just find it super uncomfortable and quite frankly unnecessary because you know it adds cost to the laptop. I fall into that category because I gave myself plenty of time to get used to the setup, but I just couldn't fall into my comfort zone of writing scripts and doing general tasks because the keys felt like they needed more force to actuate. And that tactile click just, it gets annoying, especially if you're working within a quieter space. I also found the numpad layout completely odd because usually you'll find the contextual and mathematical symbol keys at the corner. But in this case, it's right in between, uh, which just threw me off. And I don't know why ASUS did it. I mean, if you're working with a lot of numbers, this is going to be your nightmare. A few of the things to point out, the power button also acts as a fingerprint reader and it works pretty well. Uh, there's also a configurable multi-wheel located over here and it's got some pretty cool features up its sleeve. So first off, by default, uh, it controls the volume levels and if you press it, uh, it actually mutes the volume. And what you can also do is if you press it again and hold the dial, it opens a pop-up menu on the left-hand side of the screen, and you can cycle between uh, the display brightness, uh, task switcher, vertical scrolling, mic levels, keyboard brightness, and performance profile switcher. So essentially, you can use the dial to adjust these settings on the fly, which is really, really cool. Uh, and you can also arrange them depending on your priorities. The keys are backlit and they feature RGB. It's also very vivid and bright with no spill. I think this one gives the Razer's chroma lighting a run for its money, which is definitely a great thing. And customization is pretty open through Aura Sync, which can be accessed through Armory Crate. The trackpad is fairly big. I would say it fits this 17-inch form factor. It's made out of glass and it's coated with a matte finish, which is really comfortable to navigate with. Uh, it feels very similar to the XPS series from Dell. Uh, the primary left and right buttons feel nice and tactile. Nothing to complain here, except for this location because of how off-centered the trackpad is. You see, every time I just accidentally hit the middle click button instead of the left click button to register something, and it gets so annoying because of this center because every time when I'm approaching the laptop, my hands go towards the center, and I always think that I'm gonna be clicking something, but I end up you know, clicking the middle click instead of the left click button. So it gets really annoying. Uh, maybe I need to give myself more time to get used to, but uh, yeah, it's something I thought was worth mentioning. Moving on to the IO, the S17 is loaded, guys. Starting on the left-hand side, you get power in, HDMI 2.0, RJ45, a Type-A 3.2 Gen 2 port, a couple of Type-C ports with DisplayPort pass-through and power delivery. Keep in mind that one of them supports Thunderbolt 4, and then uh, you get the audio jack. Switching over to the right-hand side, you get two more USB Type-A 3.2 Gen 2 ports and a full-size UHS-2 card reader. So that's certainly good news for creators, including myself, and it's fast too. But my only issue is with its placement because it's located right below the USB ports and it's not accessible right away. You actually have to take some time to find the opening and then insert the SD card. Uh, maybe I'm being too picky, uh, but these are certainly things that would certainly affect my workflow. So. I thought uh, it was definitely worth bringing up. This is the webcam test on the S17, and the quality looks pretty good. In fact, it's much better than the Blade 14 that I just recently reviewed. Uh, it's still 720p, but you know it definitely looks pleasing to the eye. My skin tones are just fine, and the microphone sounds great. Actually, ASUS has implemented a lot of uh, AI noise canceling characteristics, which eliminates a lot of the background noise. It still sounds compressed, so I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is actually 
start typing on a mechanical keyboard and you can probably tell that it's doing a pretty good job uh, resisting that and just focusing on my vocals. The built-in speakers sound really good. There are two tweeters at the front right beside the hinge to emphasize the trebles and a few woofers at the bottom that bounce the sound off the surface to enrich the bass response. There's great depth uh, to any genre that you listen to. Moving on to the display, and what we have over here is a 17-inch screen that's Quad HD with a refresh rate of 165 hertz, backed by G-Sync and Advanced Optimus. Um, it is an IPS level type that's Pantone certified, and the colors look beautiful with excellent contrast ratios at different brightness levels. As you can see, it covers 100% sRGB, 87% Adobe RGB, and 99% DCI-P3, which is awesome for both gaming and creating content, be it photos or videos. There aren't any compromises except for the brightness levels, as it only peaks at around 350 nits, which is okay for indoor use, but outdoor use might be a little bit challenging. Now, ASUS does have a 4K 120 hertz option that comes with the top tier spec, and that supposedly gets up to 500 nits of brightness level, so that's nice, but it's gonna cost you a pretty penny, and also keep in mind that that won't come with G-Sync, but instead you get adaptive sync. Upgradeability is pretty straightforward. Once you get under the hood, you have quick access to a single sodium slot, and the maximum support of memory is 48 gigabytes, which is honestly disappointing because that onboard memory is 16 gigabytes and you can't really do 64 gigabytes. The primary NVMe SSD is right over here and the performance is absolutely insane. Getting over seven gigabytes per second on read and five gigabytes per second on write is something that I've never seen on a laptop recently. And this isn't a RAID zero configuration, guys. It's just Gen 4 SSD, which is ironic because it's the first to hit an Intel-based laptop instead of AMD. So there's that. Um, you also have two M.2 slots for storage expansion, and they can be configured in RAID 0. Now, before I get into the performance section, I do want to bring up an issue that I encountered as I was using this laptop uh, just to get regular stuff done. So take a listen to this. Now, you may or may not have picked that up, but basically, when the screen turns off, uh, it gives off this weird rattling noise. Sometimes it ends up being coil wind due to the capacitors discharging. Now, we haven't seen any other reviewers mention this, uh, but at the same time, I have to mention that I could have received a sample with a lemon in it, so um, I just wanted to put that out there. All right, so with that out of the way, I think it's time to take a look at clock speeds, temperatures, and power over time. Now, the first thing that you have to remember is that the i9-11900H inside this thing is rated to run up to 45 watts. But by now, we should all know that that number is complete BS for Intel and AMD mobile chips because manufacturers can basically run them at whatever their cooling and power systems can handle and almost every one of them pushes things to the absolute max. Anyways, ASUS has included a few of their performance profile modes, just like usual. So we have turbo, silent, and uh, performance. So let's check those out. And right away, silent hits between 60 and 62 watts, which is about what we've come to expect from this mode on Intel chips. What also typically happens in performance mode is a short burst of power followed by cycling between the higher PL2, which is 95 watts in this case, and then a lower limit. It might look like a really weird behavior, but this is the way ASUS normally balances out power, noise, and temperatures on their Intel-based laptops. Turbo goes to almost desktop levels of power consumption before hitting a very constant 90 watts, but at the same time, the fans were running at 100%, so this isn't really a mode you'd wanna use on a normal basis. The clock speeds follow exactly the same arcs as power, but there are two things I want to point out. First of all, performance hits higher peak speeds more often than turbo, but it also has a ton of variance, and that'll negatively impact our performance results. Also, silent mode is just 100 megahertz above Intel's base clock spec. As for temperatures, you guessed it. In silent, they're super cool. Turbo starts off a bit high, but then stays below just 80 degrees, and that's because the fans are running so darn high. But if you look at performance mode, man, that's just all over the place. What we're looking for in these charts is consistency, and that's not what's happening here. Either way, the noise produced by the S17 isn't bad at all until you get to turbo mode, and that is when things get really loud. I also need to mention the fan speeds in performance mode go through the same wave type inconsistent pattern you saw in the temperatures, clock speeds, and power graphs. 
It starts quiet, gets louder, and then quiets down again, over and over again. Um, it's pretty annoying, and I hope ASUS improves this in the upcoming models uh, or through a firmware update. But because of the S17's bigger footprint, a lot of the heat is distributed evenly through the chassis, so you won't have to worry about any massive hotspots. I'm sure the elevated keyboard area helps out with that as well. And what about battery life? Well, the S17 really isn't meant as a portable device. It's more of a desktop replacement. So the focus here wasn't to deliver all day use away from a charger. We also have to remember that this is still a 17 inch laptop with a massive screen to power and that leads to battery results that are, well, they're all right. A few years ago, getting eight hours of web browsing on a gaming laptop was a miracle, but now it's pretty much expected as a minimum. But it's a bit hard to compare here too because none of the other competitors in this chart has the same size screen because they're all 15 inch laptops. Moving on to heavier load and there's no surprise here either. The only standout is the Zephyrus G15 that uses a lower wattage 5900 HS. So it pulls way ahead while all the others are cluttered around the same 90 minute mark. Now taking a look at real world performance, the S17 and its 11900H CPU takes the lead in Cinebench single cores and it also pushes out really, really impressive multi-core results. But remember what I said a few seconds ago, Intel CPUs are made to run at high power or PL2 levels for short bursts, but longer term performance will be lower. That means shorter synthetic tests like Cinebench see huge numbers, but others, well, let's take a look. And what you'll start to see here is a bit of a trend. A lot of folks have bashed Intel for not having an answer to Zen 3, and that might be true on the desktop side, but not on laptops. These 11 gen CPUs are starting to look very, very competitive. And remember, this is with a power setting that's anything but consistent. So it really makes me wonder how good this thing would look if ASUS um, ever even things out to maybe a constant 85 watts. Another small surprise is in Premiere where the new 11 gens are just beasts, probably because of the improved lightly threaded performance. Resolve on the other hand is more about the GPU with a smaller emphasis on CPU horsepower, but I also have to wonder what's going on here since the S17 does have one of the most powerful GPUs we've ever seen. And speaking of the RTX 3080 in this thing, let's see how it performs. There's actually a lot to like here since this is actually the first time I've seen an RTX 3080 consistently running above 125 watts, even in performance mode. Meanwhile, Turbo really takes things to the next level and pushes the power level all the way uh, to about 138 watts. As for Silent, just avoid it altogether, guys, if you want a game, since it's all over the place and it won't deliver consistent frame rates. It also looks like all that power doesn't really affect temperatures in any meaningful way, since the GPU never went over 78 degrees in any of the modes. But I also want to stop here for a second and mention how remarkable this is. We have some of the highest power limits on the laptop market's highest end graphics card, along with some of the lowest temperatures I've seen. And that really goes to show how well ASUS has designed their cooling system. And because of that extra power coupled with lower temperatures, performance and turbo modes end up offering some impressive high clock speeds as well. But you do have to remember that turbo hits those numbers because the fans are operating at 100% all the time. So like I said before, it's best to avoid that setting unless you absolutely need a speed boost. And there's a reason why you didn't see the silent clock speeds until now, because like I said, if you're gaming, just forget that this mode even exists. So I guess that sets a stage for the gaming results. And I do want to make one thing very clear again. We never ever run laptop benchmarks in any mode that pushes the fan speeds to 100%. Instead, settings like Asus' performance mode or Legion's gaming mode are used. And that's why we list the observed GPU power rather than the absolute maximum in the gaming charts, since that should give you a better idea on how each system stacks up. So bringing up the first game, I wanna highlight what I'm gonna be doing a bit differently here, and that's calling attention to two laptops. Of course, the first one is the Zephyrus S17, but there's also the Zephyrus Duo 15 SE. Now, I know it's a 15 inch laptop, but it also rocks an RTX 3080 and goes for about the same amount of money. Other than the size and a bit lower wattage GPU, the only real difference in the SC is the Ryzen 9 uh, 5900HX processor. So let's get on with the rest of this because what we're about to see here is complete domination right across the board, especially in games that are typically CPU limited. I can't say this with 100% confidence until we test more laptops with Intel's 11th gen processors, 
but it looks like they could be absolute beasts when it comes to gaming. I mean, in many cases, it isn't even close, and the Zephyrus S17 posts numbers that actually look closer to desktops rather than other laptops. Now, 1440p moves us into a bit more GPU bottleneck territory, but even here, the S17 leads by a pretty large margin in a lot of titles, and even in areas where the averages are close. Um, the 11900H and RTX 3080 combo delivers much better 1% lows, and that leads to games feeling a lot more fluid. Overall, though, this is one of the most exciting set of gaming results I've seen in a long time, guys. Kudos to Asus for using that bigger 17-inch chassis to push all the components to the max without crazy noise or temperatures. All right, final thoughts on the ROG Zephyrus S17. This is simply the fastest gaming laptop that we've tested by a long shot, guys. I mean, the numbers really do speak for themselves, and the temperatures are extremely under control. So I have no issues recommending this to anyone looking for that elite or the enthusiast ultimate powerhouse that's also somewhat portable. I also really love this configurable multi-wheel dial over here that's quick to access and it works on the fly without having to rely on secondary function keys. Build quality is great, port selection is loaded, and I really appreciate the stealth design that you get with the S17. I just wish if the display got brighter and there's a keyboard. I just couldn't comfortably type on it because of how much force it needed, and also that tactile bump. It just, it's not my cup of tea. The uh, numpad layout is also something that completely threw me off. The trackpad is also located at an odd location. And I mean, look, if you're willing to bypass all these issues that I just mentioned, and if you find the price justifiable, then the S17 is a great buy, provided you can actually find one. So on that note, thank you so much for watching. I hope you were able to take away everything that you needed to know about the ROG Zephyrus S17. Um, let us know what you guys think about its performance. You know, is it something that you expected for that elite, you know, desktop replacement laptop? I'm, I'm curious to know. I'm surprised by the results. I mean, it's just super fast and, you know, I wanted to switch to it, but it's just this keyboard and this trackpad, man. I just, you know, can't, can't get around it. So yeah, I'm going to wrap it off and I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Spend responsibly, folks.